Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, bless us as we study Exodus chapter 6. And as chapter 6 talks about the covenant relationship and God's desire to remember the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Help us, Lord, to understand the importance of the covenant and how God fulfilled his promise when he sent Moses to deliver the Israelites. And also help us to understand how all the promises of God will be fulfilled in Christ. We ask this through Christ our Lord, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, my brothers and sisters, we're, we are studying Exodus chapter 6. And one thing I want to say about the Old Testament is, when we know the Old Testament well, we understand the New Testament better. There is a saying in the early church that the new is hidden in the old. And the old is manifested in the new. And the reason I share this with you, the new is hidden in the old, the old is manifested in the new, is because in the early church, when they read the New Testament, they constantly looked back to the Old Testament, and they saw how everything was fulfilled in Christ. And many people don't know this, but the New Testament was not written right away. The early church actually talked about Jesus and proclaimed Jesus from the Old Testament. They actually proclaimed the Christ. They proclaimed our Lord from the Old Testament. It's amazing if you think about it. The Gospel of Mark was written around 70 AD, 65 or 70 AD, Matthew 80 AD, Luke 90 AD, John 100 AD, sometime around there, give or take a few years. But you're looking at a few generations after Christ rose from the dead. What did the early church use primarily? They used the Old Testament to talk about the gospel. Isn't that amazing to think? And so when we read the Old Testament, we read the Old Testament, but also through the eyes of faith, through the person of Christ our Lord, as the early church did. And we ask ourselves, as we read the Exodus, how does this help us to understand who Jesus is? If you read the Old Testament that way, you're going to show up to Mass on time. Why is that? Because we start Mass, and what's the very first reading? Almost always it's from the Old Testament. And I, sometimes we start Mass, and I look out there, and I see half the people are present. And they're kind of filing in as the readings are going on. Oh, it's just the Old Testament. And they're filing in. And then, at, you know, at the moment that I pick up the book of Gospels and I turn around and I, I, I see all these people there and I, I go, oh my goodness, how did they all get here? They all showed up before the Gospel. Well, guess what? You're really missing out. You're probably not going to understand all that's being proclaimed. You know, take the time and get there early. Spend time in prayer before Mass, and look at that Old Testament reading and ask yourself, how does it relate to that New Testament reading, to the Gospel? There's almost always a relationship between the Old Testament reading, the responsorial psalm, and the Gospel. So let's go to Exodus chapter 6 now. Verse 1, But the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will send them out. Ye, with a strong hand, he will deliver them out of this land. And God said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, the Lord, I did not my, make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them 
to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they dwelt as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groanings of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold in bondage. I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and cruel bondage. The irony in chapter 6 is that some of the most beautiful covenant language is found in chapter 6. You have to take it and really go through and look at what God is saying about his covenant. His covenant is like a sacred marriage. I will be your God and you will be my people. That phrase is actually called the covenant formula. Here's the Lord expressing his covenant like a sacred marriage. I will be your God and you will be my people. I will redeem you. And the problem is the people are not listening. Their spirit is broken. They've really given up. And a lot of times this can happen to people in their own spiritual life. They have a broken spirit and they just are unable to listen to the Lord. And so I ask you to really consider this in your own life. Are you able to listen to God? Are you able to truly seek his will? What must you do in your own life to truly listen to the Lord? Do not let trials, tribulation, problems, persecution make you death. To the Lord. So let's go back and look at this a little bit here. Verse number two, God says, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. If you go back to Genesis chapter 17, Genesis chapter 17, God appeared to Abraham and gave him the special name El Shaddai. You may have heard that name before. El Shaddai, which means God Almighty. And so there's a reference here back to Genesis chapter 17. But one thing that is special about the Exodus is God appeared to Moses and gave his name to Moses, but in giving his name, he's going to reveal his salvation. He's going to reveal his salvation for his people. And so the way that God revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was through covenant promises. Now God is going to reveal himself to Moses by fulfilling those promises through works of salvation and judgment. And this is essentially what's going on here, that God's basically saying, they didn't see my salvation and my judgment as you will see it. So let's go and see what happens here. Let's go down to verse 5. God says this, Moreover, I have heard the groanings of the people of Israel from the Egyptians. I have heard the groanings of the people of Israel whom the Egyptians hold in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. The word remember in Hebrew, zachar, it has a, you could say, um, broader sense 
than the word in English or Spanish to remember. When we talk about the word to remember in English or Spanish, in many Western languages, we're thinking of, you know, thinking about something, remembering something cognitively. It's more a process of thought. But the word in Hebrew has the sense of also an action happening. Why do I say this? Well, if you go back to Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. Here's an example. God suddenly remembers Noah. The world is covered with water. Noah's in his ark. And suddenly God remembers Noah. What does he do when he remembers Noah? He remembers the promise that he made to Noah. The earth dries up. He fulfills his promise to Noah. And a similar thing is happening here. God is not just going to cognitively think about the promise he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is going to fulfill the covenant promise. So we see a divine action taking place when God remembers his covenant. Why do I bring this up? Well, I bring it up because a lot of times if we, if we don't see some of the nuances in the text, we can misinterpret the text, okay? And so this word, remember, this will come up again in, in conversations. I'll bring it up to you. But when God says, I have remembered my covenant, he's basically saying, I'm fulfilling my covenant. I'm acting on my covenant. The promise is being actualized and fulfilled. Do you see what's going on here? Okay, so go, let's now go down to verse 6. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from Egypt under the bur I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their bondage. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you as my people. These four verbs are so important. I will bring you out. I will deliver you. I will redeem you. And I will take you as my own. These four verbs are so important because they tell us something about the divine act that God is doing. And in the celebration of the Passover, there's an special emphasis on those four actions. However, what's the problem? The Israelites are suffering and they don't realize because they're focusing more on their own suffering rather than on God's promise, rather than on what the Lord wants to share to them. And the last verb, I will take you as my own. I will take you for my people. I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. In this last act of taking Israel as his own and Israel knowing the Lord, it's, it's part of the expression that God is making to his people that the covenant will be like a sacred marriage. The only problem is the Israelites are not going to understand the full meaning of all that's happening. And the very same thing happens. People come to church, they are baptized in Christ, they receive the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus in the Eucharist, they receive confirmation, they're strengthened in the Spirit, but they don't realize the full significance of their faith. And the question is, do you want to make the same mistake that the Israelites did? focusing more on their problems rather than focusing on what God is trying to do. And it, so we have to constantly be able to look away from the problems that we have and in the midst of those problems, look to the Lord and say, Lord, help me to understand what you want to do in my life. Let's go down to verse 9. Moses spoke to the people of Israel, but they did not listen. They had a broken spirit because of their cruel bondage. So let's go to verse 10. And the Lord said to Moses, Go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? Who am I 
a man of uncircumcised lips. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge to the people of Israel and to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. These are the heads of their fathers' houses, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, Hanak, Palu, Hezron, Carmi. These are the families of Reuben, the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Sohar, Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. These are the families of Simeon. These are the names of the sons of Levi according to their generations, Gershon, Kohath. Merari, the years of the lives of Levi being 107 years. Let me explain the meaning of, of this a little bit. First and foremost, you see Moses is kind of losing his own confidence. He's a leader and he's losing his own confidence because he's scandalized by how the people have lost their faith. It's so important for us, no matter what problem we see, to not lose confidence in God's ability to act in our lives. And so now we get, a, we get a list of some of the children here. Who was the oldest of the Israelites? If you remember the 12 children that Jacob had, the tribe that belonged to the eldest son was Reuben. Remember that tribe, Reuben? And then it goes on and it, and it talks about the sons of Levi. Who were the sons of Levi? Gershon, Kohath, Merari. These names are important because when the priests are divided up into groups later on in the book of Numbers, they're divided up according to these clans. And so we go to verse 17. It says that the sons of Gershom were Libni, Shimei, by their families, the sons of Kohath, Amran, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel. The years of life of Kohath being a hundred and 33 years. The sons of Merari, Mali, and Mushi, these are the families of the Levites according to their generation. Amran took the wife of Jacobed, his father's sister, and she bore him Aaron and Moses, the years of the life of Amran being 137 years. The sons of Ishar, Korah, Nepheg, and Zikri, and the sons of Uziel, and Mishael, Elzaphon, and Sith, Sithri. And Aaron took the wife of Elisheba. Elisheba, very interesting. The wife of Aaron, Elisheba. You know what the word means in English? Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Elisheba literally means, my God has sworn. And you're probably reading this and going, oh my goodness, why do we have all these names? Let me explain. It's not an accident. They're giving us the names of all the Levit Levitical tribes, all the priestly tribes. Why is this important? Well, when you get to the book of Numbers and you look at how the tabernacle is taken care of, all these names that we have here become important because when you get to Numbers chapters three through six, Numbers three through six, you get to see how everything is assembled and taken down in the tabernacle and how these tribes all have special duties. Okay, that's the first point. The second point is what's so interesting here is that the wife of Aaron, the very first high priest, her name is Elisheba. Elisheba or Elisheba, it means my God has sworn or promised. Isn't that beautiful? And guess what? Guess what? In the New Testament, the mother of John the Baptist had the same name, Elizabeth, which means Elisheba. So let's go on here a little bit. Verse uh, 20, 24, the sons of Korah, Asir, Elkanah, Abiasaph, and these are the families of the Kor Korahites, Eleazar, Aaron's son, took a wife, one of the daughters of Putiel, and she bore him Phineas. And these are the heads of the father's houses of the Levites by their families. These are the, these are the Aaron and the Moses, whom the Lord said, Bring out the people of Israel from the land of Egypt by their host. It was they who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing out the people of Israel from Egypt, this Moses and this Aaron. On the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, 
The Lord said to Moses, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? And so we, we finish chapter 6 on this note right here. We have a list of all the Levitical clans, and it will become more important as we read the story when we get to Numbers chapters 3 through 6. But we also see Moses in a, in a, really in a state of doubt. I mean, he's, he's really in a trial. The people are complaining to Moses. They're upset. And Moses is turning to the Lord, and he's kind of going through his own uh, vocation crisis, if you will. You know, Lord, I mean, how can I speak to the Pharaoh? The people aren't listening to me. They're suffering. He doesn't understand that in order to do God's will, we must live with sacrificial love. We must make sacrifices. And this is something that the Israelites begin to understand, this concept of sacrificial love, the sacrifices that must be made in order to do God's will. And of course, when Christ comes into the world, He reveals that same sacrificial love of the Father, a donative sacrificial love, giving His entire life for our salvation. So I leave you on this note. What is your concept of sacrificial love? Are you able to live that out in your life? And especially in the midst of trial and tribulation. Ask God for the gift to be able to recognize when you need to, you know, have perseverance. And also for the, for the ability to truly live a life of sacrificial love in Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the opportunity to have studied Exodus chapter 6. And as you proclaimed your desire to take Israel as a people, as they failed to understand your desire, help us, Lord, to not make the same mistake and to say yes to Christ every day of our lives. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.